landscape. And um, at the trustees, I monitored probably, well, around 100 easements a year. We were in charge of uh, keeping track of 300, over 300 easements, uh, monitoring over 300 easements per year. So that's my background. Now I work at Landscape with Caleb. Um, but I really like talking about easement management. I really like talking about easement stewardship conundrums. And that's how I'm going to focus today's training, is I'm going to focus it around um, easement stewardship in particular. But everything I'm going to talk about today can also be applied to fee stewardship, although maybe not so much reserve rights and approvals, but certainly issues, as I'm showing you, everything that issues can do. Um, you can definitely apply what you're going to learn today to issues themselves, uh, to using issues for fee management as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and show my fancy stewardship dashboard here. Um, uh, oh, and one more note before I really get started. Um, hopefully I cover a lot of your questions during the course of the training, but um, uh, if you do have any questions at the end, we'll make sure to leave time and you, you'll just be able to type them in the chat and then we'll try to get to all of them. Of course, if we don't have time, we'll just email you afterwards. Oh, and with me today also is of course Caleb for show. Most of you know Caleb. Uh, he designed and built and maintains uh, landscape, so he's the he's the other half, but he's just back up today. So, um, hey everybody, hi, <laughs> hi Caleb. Um, so, issues um, uh, issues are ways in landscape of tracking not only potential violations on our easements, but issues are a really good way of tracking anything that needs follow up on these stewardship sites. So if I go to one of our stewardship sites, again, I'm gonna be using a made up easement today as an example. The issues live inside of the status tab. There are other things uh, in a stewardship site that I'm gonna be pointing out today that you can use to track issues, um, other features, but for the most part, we're gonna to stick to the status tab. So if you're uh, looking around inside of a record, and this is really basic, but if you're looking around inside of a record, you can't find the status tab. It's because you're in a property record. You need to go to the stewardship site. So from the status tab, here's where you can build issues. And issues, like I said, are anything that's going to need follow-up. So this is uh, not necessarily, again, a violation. Maybe this is um, a pending property transfer which I'm gonna use as an example. Um, uh, this is third party encroachment. Um, this is really anything where you wanna red flag it. You, wanna, you want this thing that rise to the top in terms of, of stuff that you need to be monitoring as an organization. So to add an issue, just click on the plus button. And now we're inside of an issue record. The map on the right, we can also change issue geography, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, in a little bit. But now we can uh, start adding our details for this particular issue. And for this one, I'm going to say, as an example, a landowner decided to be really, really nice and give us a call and say, hey, I'm putting my property on the market. So right away, we know that that's a follow-up item. We know that that's something that needs to rise to the top. And so I'm going to call this Mill River Easement Pending Transfer. So we gave the issue a name. We can add an additional description if we want. This description can be like uh, a full narrative of like everything, but we can also use these fields to fill in the narrative. There's an identified on date. So that would be in this case, the, the day the person called. There's a reported on date, um, which can be separate if you need it to be. I'm just gonna fill it in as today as well. And then there's a resolved on date. The resolved on date is what's going to allow you to filter out issues that have been addressed um, from the ones that haven't been. So this is like issue is complete, right? Uh, that we're done dealing with this thing. And so for me, this really means like I only enter this resolved on date when there is nothing left to do with this issue. So with a pending property transfer, this would be after the property has changed hands, after we have provided the new owner with the BDR, after that BDR has been signed, 
then I get to mark this as resolved. But until then, I'm going to keep this open because this is how I'm monitoring that entire situation, right? And really, our job isn't complete until that, BD, that BDR has been signed, until that baseline documentation report has been signed by the new owner. So I'm going to leave that blank for now. Issues can have types. You can define these types in settings. So it's going to be in settings. You need to be an administrator to see this. But you can go to settings list items, and then stewardship, and uh, look for the, the issue type category. Um, so um, I've added the type here of pending property transfer. I think that's a useful type to have. And then there's severity. You can also change the available severities. Um, for now, I'm just going to list this as staff follow-up to help us uh, categorize it. So. Now we've entered the basic data, and I want to start keeping track of the communications that are flying back and forth regarding this pending transfer. So the first thing I'm going to actually enter is that phone call from the landowner. So landowner called, said he's selling. I'm going to add who, um, uh, who contacted us. So this is the landowner. This is our made-up landowner in this case. And the type was a call. So that's nice and simple, easy peasy. But say we also want to get a hold of the realtor, and we really want to get in front of this situation and provide the realtor with the, the easement document. And we want to start tracking that realtor as a potential point of contact for this. Well, um, maybe Sean gave us the realtor's information. And so now I'm going to call the realtor, explain. Uh, conservation easements. So everyone's on the same page. We don't have a contact record for them yet, but that's okay. We can just make one. So I'm going to add person. I'm going to say this is uh, Larry Smith, and he works for Leafy Greens Realty. So now we have just a basic contact record to track um, that any interactions with that realtor. So using this process, we can track all of the communications that are flying back and forth about this. When the realtor calls us and says they have an interested buyer, we can enter that communication. We can enter the new landowner as another contact. But another thing we can do as this is sort of drawing out, as we're having a lot of communications with Larry Smith, maybe, is we can enter Larry in the main active contacts page. So if I go back to details, down here in active contacts, I'm going to add a contact and then choose an existing contact. And I'm going to choose Larry. Lots of Larry's here, but there's our Larry Smith for Leafy Greens Realty. So it took us directly to the parcel contact record. So now we can define this person's relationship with the, the, the parcel. I'm going to delete the landowner tag that's the default and just add our realtor tag. Again, I added that in settings. I can add more property relationship notes if I want, like specifically say that this is Sean's realtor. Um, and uh, of course, I can add more information like his phone number, his email address. This is showing us all our communications with this individual down here. And then, of course, when this individual is no longer affiliated with the property, after the property sells, we can do this with the landowner uh, uh, information as well, with the landowner um, record as well. We can add an end date. And then um, they will be put into the inactive contacts list. We'll do that quite yet. So if I go back to active contacts, here's our realtor. It's front and center. Whenever we come to this record, we're going to see that um, this realtor is um, uh, dealing with this property. But like I said, we can add an end date here. And we, we didn't have to delete that contact. They just moved to inactive contacts down here. So when the new landowner comes along, we'll do the same thing with the, the old landowner. We'll give the Sean that inactive contact state after the property sells. 
And then Sean will be moved down here into inactive contacts where we'll be still be able to tell that he was once the landowner and he was the grantor of this particular easement. So by doing this, by managing contact records in this way, by tagging them appropriately, by adding communications within the issue, we can get a really comprehensive picture of the entire situation. We can also add notes if we want. These are maybe internal notes saying, um, uh, discussing maybe the terms of the easements or to-do items. The only other thing I'll point out that you uh, may want to do with an issue is use yet another feature of landscape, and that's tasks. And so, especially with getting that BDR to the new landowner, we probably want to have a to-do item for that. We, we actually want to have a, a list of things that we need to do, or um, just in this case, one thing that we need to do, which is get that BDR to the landowner. And we want to track whether that particular thing has been done. And for that, we can use tasks. And so this button over here is tasks. I know that's kind of mysterious, a mysterious button, uh, and you might not use it that often, but it can be really, really useful for tracking this stuff. Um, I already made one earlier. I'm just going to delete it. <laughs> OK, so now we're looking at a list of tasks for this particular stewardship site. So I want to add a to-do item that says, get the BDR to the new landowner. So get BDR to new landowner. This is after we have an interested buyer, and we want to make sure that they sign that BDR. So you can see it's got an owner. I can use this to assign uh, this task to someone else. It's got a status, not started. Uh, the status can be not started, waiting, in progress, or completed. And then it's got a timeline. When do you want to do this by? Um, so uh, maybe I want to do this by March 31st. So um, using these tasks, so what just happened in addition to creating a task is an email alert got generated and sent to me saying, hey, you have a thing to do. Um, as that thing comes due, I'll get another email alert saying, hey, have you done this thing? You can adjust those email alerts in settings. Tasks right now in Landscape are the only things that generate those email alerts. Um, so you can monitor your tasks within a stewardship site, or you can monitor them globally from like your dashboard. You can have a widget displaying all of the tasks that you need to do. There's also the handy task button from the dashboard um, that you can click on to see all of your tasks. Um, this is our sample account, so I have a great many tasks assigned to me. Um, here, our BDR is down. Our BDR task is down here at the bottom. So tasks can be really useful in making sure that um, you do the things that need to get done uh, that are related to any particular issue. So I'm going to head back to the stewardship site and go back to status. And I'm just going to mark this as resolved. We're going to pretend that this property is sold, and we provided them with the BDR, and everything was great. And they're really excited to have purchased um, a conserved property. Wonderful. So the other workflow I want to uh, talk about today, something really, really common, is when you find something in the field on your monitoring visit. So you're out there. You're using the Landscape mobile app to uh, collect your site visit data. And you see something where you're like, oh no, this is bad, or like this, maybe this just deserves follow up. So I want to um, take a moment to talk about, um, and I'm actually going to uh, bring up the app and, and show you how this um, will work. So the important thing before I bring up the app is to talk about sort of the role of a site visit um, and the way, at least, I think of. of a site visit. So a site visit to me is a record of your visit or my visit to a site on a particular day. It's a record of the, that property's um, uh, status uh, at a particular point in time uh, that you then sign, and it's a permanent record. The property was like this on a certain day, and that's that's this is the report showing that. And because a site visit record is static like that because it's meant to be a permanent record where you're not going back in and changing things after the fact. 
site visit records are actually very bad places to track follow-up items like after you after you've left the site and after you've generated the report you can always have a field in your form saying did you notice anything but then that field is always going to be static and so that's why we give you the ability to make an issue in the field using the mobile app because issues are really much better for tracking follow-up items that you find in the field than a site visit, which again is a permanent record and isn't good for you know going back in and recording communications regarding stuff and, and, and things like that. So if we look at the app, here we are at the Mill River easement. I'm just going to go ahead and um, activate uh, a visit so you can see what this might look like. So here we are, we're doing our visit. We're walking around. Um, the yellow means it's active, of course. We're walking around and we uh, find something and we take a photograph, a photograph of it. And oh no, there's a skitter. <laughs> it's driven over a stone wall. It's uh, started to cut down trees and we just happen to be out there. This is based on a true story, but it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we photograph the encroachment by the neighbor. We're going to call this third-party encroachment, and we're going to say that the neighbor was driving the skitter for the purposes of the of the example. And so now this photo is going to go into our monitoring report. Um, <clears throat> but we also want to make sure that we uh, create create an issue. We create an issue while we're in the field that can then be followed up with independently and can be tracked independently. So from within the uh, site visit. So here we are in our site visit details. This should look familiar with to you if you're using the new version of the app. I should say, absolutely, I'm, I'm using the latest version of the Landscape mobile app, which, um, so if you're looking at this and you're wondering why it doesn't look like yours, we have a new version of the app, Landscape Mobile 3, really streamlines the process. Um, so you should download it if you don't have it yet. So you're in the field and down here at the bottom of the form, you can add an issue. This is also available in the site details section of the app, so you don't necessarily have to start a, a visit in order to record an issue. Um, but from within a visit, here's how you would add an issue. So you can just click on add issue. We're gonna say uh, timber trespass. You can add a description if we want, a type, and say it's trespass. A severity, I'm going to keep it as staff follow-up, and I'm going to go back. And that's all there is to it. We just created an issue. We created that red flag that will now appear here in the website that we can track independently. So um, if I give it enough time, and if I finish my site visit, and I'm going to go back here. And just let me uh, synchronize this. And if I talk long enough, um, then that issue will appear right here in uh, status. So um, uh, I hope you can see uh, how that worked. I was in the field. I was in the middle of my site visit. Um, I took a photo of it within the site visit record. Um, uh, and it's going to show up in the monitoring report. But I also created a separate issue. But now we have a problem. This issue that I created, which is now appears, doesn't have anything associated with it. So that nice photo of that big giant skitter is nowhere, is, is, hasn't been associated with this particular record yet. Um, luckily, there's a really easy way of doing that. So go to the work tab, and we're gonna go to that site visit record. I'm gonna select the correct point that's showing the encroachment. And there's this button right here, the convert to issue button. So using that button, you can actually, you can create a whole new issue. Um, if you didn't create the issue in the field, that's what you could do. Or you can copy it to an existing issue. So in this case, I'm gonna copy it to the timber trespass issue. I'm gonna click okay. It just copied over the geography as well as the photo. It's still gonna remain in our site visit. 
and in our report. But now when I head over to status um, and click on this issue, you'll see there is our, uh, here is our photo point with our photo. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, geography and mapping. Of course, we're going to touch on mapping a lot more in the, um, in the mapping uh, training. Um, uh, but just a really quick recap. This on the left is the issue record for this individual issue. Over here on the right, we have geography that belongs to this issue. So we, have, we can have different points. We can have areas. So if I click on the layers, we see everything available to us. We can have points, lines, areas. In this case, we imported a point, and that point has a photo. But the important thing to point out is that this point has its own set of details that we can define and just use to manage this geography point. So I'm going to give this the same name, or rather, I'm going to call it Skitter. I can update the label. I can give it its own type, its own status, if I want to. But I'm just going to keep it like that. And so now we have, uh, uh, we're getting a more clear picture if someone comes to this record of, of where the particular photo is, uh, was taken, where the encroachment is happening, and stuff like that. So, um, but now we need to start communicating with this neighbor. So uh, to do that, we're going to use the same exact workflow that we used in the first example. I'm going to add um, uh, a, a new communication. And I'm going to say contacted neighbor about neighbor trespass. We don't have a record yet, so I'm going to add a new person. I'm going to say Terry Timber Pirate. I'm going to say OK. So we just created a little contact record just to hold that information. And it turns out that Terry Timber Pirate is actually a neighbor. So what I'm going to do, this is someone who we may be interacting with a lot in the future. Um, I mean, regardless of how this situation turns out, you want to know that Terry Timber Pirate is a neighbor, and you probably want to know that he owns this land over here. So uh, first thing I'm going to do, exactly like in the first example, I'm going to head back to details. And this is one of those things that's really applicable to um, fee land stewardship as well, so fee lands, encroachment, stuff like that. I'm going to add an act, uh, a new uh, contact, choose existing contact, and we're going to choose Harry Timber Pirate. We can add a phone number, uh, an email address, anything like that, um, notes. But the important thing, of course, is to update these tags so he's not the easement landowner. But he's not only going to get a neighbor tag, he's going to get this mean third party encroachment tag. Um, uh, so that's <laughs> mostly necessary if you have a bunch of neighbors <laughs> that you're interacting with a lot. And maybe you want to highlight the ones that are particular tr particularly troublesome. You can give them an additional tag if you like, if this is getting kind of busy and you, you want to um, manage uh, those neighbors a little differently than you manage your nice neighbors. So. Heading back into status, the final thing I want to know for Terry Timber Pirate is where exactly his parcel is, so that future monitors can know that this boundary is something we want to pay attention to in the future. So I'm going to go back to the issue. Notice in the stewardship site context, if I click on this layers button, I cannot edit the issue geography. That's because landscape wants you to be inside of the record that you're editing before you edit the geography for that thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't know which issue geography you were editing. So I'm going to go into Issues, going to click on Layers. And now the issues are up at the top. We can edit the geography for this particular record. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw Terry Timber Pirate's parcel on the map so we know he's a troublemaker. Click thumbs up to save my edit. We could also have imported that parcel information, of course, um, using the uh, import button right here. 
So now we're beginning to get a much more complete picture of this whole situation. We know where the skitter was found. We know that uh, Terry owns this parcel. And notice when I click on the parcel now, or the, you know, the parcel boundary that I just made up, <laughs> um, we can edit this geography now as well. So Terry's parcel. Maybe we actually want to enter the uh, block and lot if, that's, if that applies. Um, and we could add more descriptions as well for that particular uh, item. So um, like I said, we're getting a more complete picture. Monitors who are out in the field um, in the future, if this has not been resolved, um, uh, or if it has been resolved, will be able to see the issue geography within the app. So of course, you can activate the issues layer in the mobile app and see all of the issues that you've started to map out on your easement or fee holding or wherever it is. So um, uh, that is managing third-party encroachment. Of course, it's probably not gonna be as dramatic as dri someone driving a skitter onto your easement. Um, it'll probably be a bunch of leaf piles and a bunch of junk by you know, abutting landowners and you'll have maybe a lot of different parcels that you're managing um, and you're sending out letters to them and you're, um, tracking the letters that are coming back. Um, so each of those uh, various encroachments, if you have multiple encroachments, can be managed independently as their, as their own issue records. And um, so then each of those records can have their own geography. Again, there are notes, there's a documents field for any documents that you need. So the final example I wanna talk about is the you should have asked permission example of, of your, you're out in the field and you find something that, oh, you know, the landowner probably should have asked permission to do that. Um, and it's gonna make a really nice segue into uh, rights and approvals. So this time, rather than showing you how to do this in the app, I'm gonna go uh, back to our site visit record. And it looks like we found a lean to that uh, he had the landowner had a right to build, but um, needed to notify us first, and they didn't. And so we want to flag that as an issue first. So I'm going to use the same uh, workflow that we used before. I'm going to click on this button right here. And I'm going to say create a new issue for this. It's going to say good job. Going to head over to status. Here's our new issue. It's got that silly name of photo point three, so I'm going to change that first. It inherited that, of course, from the geography. Um, and I'm going to say lean to. We could add a description if we wanted to. I'm just going to update the reported on field. And I'm going to give this an actual violation type, um, but maybe the severity I'm going to. Uh, be a little bit more lax and I'm going to say, well, maybe this is a possible violation. Um, <clears throat> so now we've got the geography of the issue over here. We can see where the lean to uh, was constructed. And we review the easement um, when we get back to the office. And it says that small temporary agricultural structures under X square feet are allowed with notification. But now we want to record that formal approval of, um, uh, or yeah, that formal uh, acknowledgement of the notification that they didn't really give uh, in its appropriate place so that future stewards can know that the organization addressed this issue by giving an after the fact sort of approval, if you will. So I'm gonna head back to issues and so this has really turned into a request and approvals thing, right? So you can click on the check mark, click on this button right here. It's gonna say, um, if you have any communications that you made in this issue, it's gonna put them all with the right and approvals request rather than the, the issue. I'm gonna say, yep, that's fine new approval record has been added, that's great. And so now we're managing that sort of official acknowledgement um, 
or the official decision on this particular structure. So going to go into it. And uh, now we're inside of a write or approval record. It has a name. They have a type. I'm going to give this one construction type. I can add a description if I want. Exercise requirement is a really important field in the context of reserve rights and approvals. Um, this nothing, choosing nothing, notification, or approval will change uh, the fields that, uh, or will change the appearance of the fields here. So if I click on nothing, you'll see that it changed to right, because technically, if someone doesn't have to do anything, it's a, it's a as of right thing. But you can still record it in the rights section if you'd like, if you just want to acknowledge it and say, yes, we are aware that this happened. There's also notification, which I'm going to say that this one is. And then there's approval. You can see notification still calls it a right. So what I'm going to say for this, I'm going to add a note actually on our interpretation of the easement. And I'm going to say um, uh, temporary structures allowed. You probably want to go into more detail, maybe citing the specific uh, passages of the easement that allow this structure. Um, and then for the letter that you send asking, uh, uh, sort of documenting your decision to the landowner, you probably want to record that in the documents section here. You could record it as a communication, of course. And um, so you could uh, letter stating approval. Add who it was to. Change it to mailing type. And then uh, if you want to upload the letter itself, you can click on that edit button. Again, I'll do that again. So you can click on the edit button and then upload the document here. But you can also record that down here with the documents. So that's type number one, this sort of weird fuzzy thing that turned into kind of an approval where you, where you need to say, uh, you know, we, we took an official stance on this and we let the landowner know that they should have asked for permission first. So now we have a permanent record of that. Oh, and the final thing that I want to note is to, um, <clears throat> to say that this has been addressed. I want to say, give it an exercised on date. And so now it's been exercised as of 2-25, 2021. Great. So that's all buttoned up. But the other thing that the rights and approvals section can be used for is tracking those outstanding rights or um, uh, approval items that you know are hiding in easements that make you nervous. <laughs> um, so maybe these are uh, building rights that the owner has. So maybe they have the right to build something very strange in a strange area, like maybe a summer camp uh, along a river or you know, these little items that you want to make sure in the future, when stewards look at these records, those things are highlighted at the top as these, these sort of uh, existing rights that haven't been exercised yet, but are, are floating out there and are available to the landowner. So we can add a new record here. And I'm going to say a right to build. This landowner has a right to build um, two barns. Uh, so this is an existing right in an easement. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to change the exercise limit to two. And I'm going to make uh, the, um, uh, and I'm going to change this to approval. I'm going to say that we actually need to approve any, any of these two barns that this person has a right to build. And so now there's this activity tracker down here, but we don't have to use it. If we go back to the rights and approvals section, you'll see that there's right to build two barns here, and it's not been exercised yet. However, if they do choose to exercise it, we would add activity. So I'll add a new activity, and now we're in an activity record. Um, uh, this activity uh, record has its own uh, status, so active, approved, denied, or most commonly probably <laughs> approved with conditions, right? You, you have to do it in the way that you said you were going to do, or uh, you have to do some sort of mitigation 
um, or you have to follow X, Y, and Z local statutes, stuff like that. Um, uh, this activity has its own communication and its own notes. So you can track this request to build a barn um, independently of, of the other existing right that they have to build their second barn. So everything we're tracking here, any communications, will live within this first activity. So here's our activity record. We're in the approval record right now. But if I head back to rights and approvals, we'll now see that the status has changed to requested and one of two. If, they, uh, if you approve one and say, yep, that's fine. It was resolved on such and such a date. You say it was approved with conditions. But then later, they ask to build their second barn. Um, the, you can now track that uh, second um, uh, barn request independently. And right now, it's just showing us um, all communications uh, with uh, this particular um, individual. But we can now add more communications uh, regarding uh, the, this particular uh, exercise request. And when we finally do approve it, we give it a resolved on date. Maybe this is many years later. If we are looking at our list of approvals, we can now see that two out of two have been exercised. If we try to add another activity in this particular request or approval, it's gonna say, hey, they had a limit of two. Um, are you sure you wanna allow them another barn? Uh, and you would probably say no. <laughs> um, so this same workflow uh, can be used for subdivisions as well. I think that's a really common need for organizations to track is outstanding subdivision rights. So th in that case, it would just be a transfer of property type. Um, they would presumably have some sort of limit on the subdivisions. Gets a little more tricky because, of course, if they did subdivide, you would need to create a new um, parcel in the property record and a new stewardship site as well. And you would need to follow the right um, uh, to the correct stewardship site. Um, if that makes sense, so it wouldn't be quite as smooth as as the as the building approval, but um, uh, it is a very good way of highlighting um, outstanding um, subdivision rights uh, that you know are just hovering out there. So maybe they've subdivided twice; they have the right to do it one more time, and you want to make sure that nobody misses that they've already subdivided twice. This is a good way of managing. Um, that particular thing. So final thing, uh, simple example, um, sort of to recap rights and approvals is uh, the phone rings and someone has some uh, idea for something they want to do on their property and it's a, it's a one-off. And so we're not, we're not creating an issue for this. We're, we're going to track it as its own right or approval. So the landowner calls and says, I want to have a doggy daycare on my property, which is another example from real life. And uh, so we can enter a new approval record here. Now you say it's construction. I'm gonna say that we're gonna need to approve this project though. Exercise limit of one, because it's this weird thing. It's just a single request. And so as you, uh, so you can add new activity there. You can add communication again with the landowner saying, um, uh, hey, can you tell us what a doggy daycare involves? Um, what sort of structures are you going to be putting up? You can capture all of that information in the communications here. One thing I should mention is as you're adding communications in these various issue records and in these approval records, you don't need to worry about them getting lost inside of these various records. So. Um, if I enter that there, 
And so we're tracking this request independently. We're writing down notes about um, our interpretation of the easement and what it says. Um, but if I head over to the details page, you'll see that all of those communications that we're creating are not, they're not getting lost, right? They're not um, ending up somewhere where we're not able uh, to see them when we're just looking at the, at the property details. So you would uh, determine what you wanted to do with the doggy daycare. Um, uh, you'd probably, my recommendation from experience is approved with conditions uh, because doggy daycares can get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, and uh, uh, we'll say it's uh, resolved on, on on that date. So um, that is a quick rundown of requests and approvals. So we've been working inside of an individual record, but what you probably want to do is be able to log in the landscape and be able to see, hey, what are the issues that we've got on our properties, what reserved rights requests are out there that we need to be aware of and working on. And you can definitely use tasks to track that stuff, right? Just like I showed you, there's this task button. And for any one of these, you could always create a task to say, you know, contact landowner about X, Y, and Z. You can create as many tasks as you want to highlight the things that need to get done. But those are really user specific, right? Those tasks are gonna to belong to you and they're not, um, uh, they're not necessarily a good way of tracking uh, these things at a global level, tracking issues, individual issues or individual rights and approvals. And to do that, of course, you can make uh, views and you can make widgets. So um, you may have seen when I started, I have my special stewardship dashboard here um, that's got a map of requests and approvals. It's got um, a map of all of our unresolved issues. Um, so I can zoom around and I can see on a map view um, uh, what still needs to be addressed. Alternatively, of course, you could have uh, a list widget. List widgets are new. If you're not aware, you can now see um, just lists with details in them. This is uh, in the last few weeks, I think we introduced this. So you could just have a list of unresolved issues um, and, uh, or a list of requests and approvals. Um, you can see I've got, got a lot of widgets here. You can also, here's a, a task timeline widget. So if you're using tasks to track your to-do items, um, you can also have a widget. Uh, here's my get BDR to new landowner on my timeline. I should mention um, a lot of the things that I, uh, I'm talking about today. Uh, of course, you should look up on our knowledge base, um, you know, uh, widgets, and you should uh, read any articles <laughs> there. Uh, if you can't remember how to do something I'm showing you today, or, or if you want to know more, please use our, our knowledge base. And let us know what gaps you find. Let us know what you can't find on the, on the knowledge base. We're really interested in in um, uh, you know, giving you as much ability to solve these problems yourself as possible. So do reach out and let us know, um, hey, I can't figure out X, Y, and Z. So um, the first thing I wanna do is uh, my favorite way to make a widget um, or maybe just something you wanna have on hand is a view of these issues. So I'll go to views and I will change the dropdown menu to all issues. So it's just a nice built-in view that we give you. So you can see all of the issues that um, you've entered on your property. I added this last modified on date to here. So I can specifically see um, what is the latest, what is the latest thing that has been edited. This is not importantly looking at communication. So if you add a communication to an issue, this won't mark it. Um, it, it won't register as modified on. This is editing the issue record itself, so that issue data. It's also not looking at geography. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little uh, temperamental about what it's looking at, but you can always make other widgets to, or views um, to monitor changes in communications or changes um, or uh, geography um, items. 
So uh, to add this last modified on date, I should say, of course, there's this choose fields button right here where you can choose the appropriate issue or the appropriate um, field. Rather, you can uh, rearrange them by moving them up and down. You can add things. You can uh, take them away like that. And of course, you can group things as well. So if you want to um, view uh, this by uh, a stewardship site, you could select choose this and then show grouping. Change the uh, grouping field to stewardship name. And so now we have a list of all the issues by uh, stewardship site. We could also group by type if we wanted to. So now we have uh, uh, nice summaries of everything we have out there. All of our pending property transfers are nice and grouped right here. All of our trespass items are, are uh, grouped right here. So it totally depends on how you want to see it. Um, when you want to uh, save this as a widget, oh, and I, I should also mention um, the final thing you can do is I'm just going to get rid of grouping here. Of course, you can also just display this as a map. Um, this might be a hidden feature. This might be a revelation for some of you. But if you click on these three buttons, if it's a mappable thing, you can choose display as map. And now we have a map of every issue that was showing on that list we were just looking at. So these are here's our map of all unresolved issues. To save this as a um, uh, to save this as a, a widget. We would just click on save, um, uh, change this to dashboard, and then give it a good name. I should check, though. I don't think I actually filtered this down. So um, I don't think this is actually all unresolved issues quite yet. Um, so this is just all issues. You can see some of them have been resolved. Some of them haven't. Um, uh, if we want to filter out, uh, all the ones that have been resolved, uh, we can use the filter button. But what I would rather do is actually make a query. I'm going to click on this copy button. So now we can start editing this all issues view. I'm going to change this to, oops, to um, resolved on. So that's the resolved on date. And I'm going to make that um, not empty. No, empty. Right, <laughs> empty. I'm going to make it empty. So these are all un, uh, unresolved issues. So anything that has been resolved is not going to show up on our list. I'm going to click OK. See, the count went down, and none of these have been resolved. So now we have our, our, our list of um, unresolved issues. And we can save this as a view. will then show up in my uh, list of views. So below this built-in, it'll show up here in unresolved issues. I can, I can call this up at any time. I can also save it as a, as a widget. So just like I said, we can save this as a uh, list widget. So if I click on this, it'll show that, that list of um, uh, unresolved uh, issues uh, that I can then uh, navigate around. And um, I created one earlier to show this. Um, I think it's down here at the bottom. So here is my list widget of unresolved issues with my last modified on date column that I can sort. And so whenever I look at this widget, the most recently modified record is going to be right at the top. Um, so I can log in the landscape, check my unresolved issues, and see if anything has been added. So that could be uh, pretty useful. Other thing I'll point out here is I have a recent stewardship site communications. I built it in exactly the same way. I made a view of communications, and then I added the communications date. And so as these are coming through the door, maybe this isn't issues, but maybe this is monitoring letters or stuff like that. But I can also see these um, uh, all communications with all stewardship sites as they happen. So every time I log in, I can see a, a quick rundown of who's been talking to whom. So uh, the final view is um, uh, requests and approvals. So uh, requests and approvals is a little bit uh, more tricky to get at. 
Um, there is not a built-in view uh, to look at for requests and approvals yet. Um, so we're going to need to uh, do a little building of a view in order to get that. So I'm going to start with all stewardship sites because uh, requests and approvals are part of a stewardship site. I'm going to copy it because I like to start from a nice view with uh, some fields. So I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to click on this gear button and I'm going to expand and filter my results. And I'm going to change this drop down menu to rights and approval. So what I'm telling landscape is look inside stewardship sites for all of the rights and approvals records within each of those uh, stewardship sites. So this is part of, you know, you, you have to dig a little bit. But um, once we uh, click OK, um, notice our fields haven't changed yet. But when I click on this Add Fields button and scroll down to the bottom, we now have access to all of our rights and approvals fields. So we can start adding uh, anything we want to see in this view. Take things away that we don't want to see. And now we can start getting rundowns of our um, requests and approvals. In the same way that I built a filter for issues, um, you can build filters for reserved rights um, uh, and approvals. Only thing uh, I want to add that I noticed while I was building this, um, you don't want to use, if you change this drop-down menu, you don't want to use this approvals item that is actually for um, uh, property asset approvals. So this is like board approvals and stuff like that that you're tracking in a property asset. So don't let that confuse you. You want to you wanna dig into a stewardship site and get at that rights and approvals. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, I'm sure we'll see some of you at the next training. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining. See you all later.